For many of us, including myself, being helped by the helper is harder, it's a harder task than being the helper. See, the majority of people I meet from day to day, both believers and unbelievers, they want to be helpers. It is in our genes. Consider the Holy Spirit, the helper, is an aspect of God. And we are made in the image of God. So put those together. We are made then to be helpers. But to be able to help, we must first and continually be willing and able to receive help. In last week's story of Peter going to Cornelius' house, the centurion, Peter had to do a whole lot of inner work before he could do the outer work. He had to move past fear, past disgust, past prejudice, past dread in order to meet the centurion with an open heart. And while we do not get a psychological report, we do see that Peter takes his time he doesn't jump into the work right away. It takes three dreams. It takes three people. It takes him considering over a, a, a while. And before even leaving that next day, he spends the night with these people before he dares go. Peter takes time to let the spirit change him. In contrast, our two scriptures today, they give us examples of people who will not let spirit in. They're more like this. The rich man who turns away from Jesus' invitation and the Israelites who turn away from God. The story of the rich man begins with the rich man asking Jesus, what good thing shall I do in order to have eternal life? And Jesus replies, well, keep the commandments. And the rich man, being a good student, starts to recite a few of the ten. And being an excellent student, he adds one from Leviticus 19, verse 18. You will love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so he shows that he not only knows the ten commandments, but he understands the principle behind them. He knows he's called to love others. And he could have left with that, but he doesn't. Something in his spirit wants more. So he asks, what do I still lack? And Jesus says, if you want to be complete, I'll stop there. This is false translation. Other translations have that word translated as if you want to be perfect, but complete is a much better word because none of us want to be perfect, but we certainly want to be complete. If you want to be complete, then keeping the commandments and helping others is not enough. Those things lead to an incomplete life. If you want to be complete, Jesus says, go away, sell your possessions, and come and follow me. Now, realize this extraordinary invitation. The man has just been invited to be one of Jesus' followers, his disciples, to join the twelve on the journey to follow Jesus. But he's not willing to. He's not willing to let go of his possessions. He holds on, and holding on is a sign of a hardened heart. Tell me what I need to do, teacher, but don't ask me to give it all away, to put my tomorrow into your hands. Now listen, we may not be rich, but we too struggle to put ourselves into the hands of Jesus. You know, in the early days of COVID, when that stay-at-home order was first announced, quickly the grocery store shelves were emptied of toilet paper and water. And I suspect those empty shelves made an impression on you as it did me. 
Because while we want to help, while we want to be helpers, we also want to be able to supply for our own basic needs. We want to do, we want to help, and we want to stay on top. We even have an expression in our language, I'm on top of it, meaning that I've got it under control. I've got the goods. And that's all good when you are at work. You want to be able to do your job well. But when the Lord says, come and follow me, and instead we say, well, no, I'm on top of it, and we walk away, it is time for us to have a heart check. Catherine Marshall tells the story of two men, Jack and Sam. And Jack was having trouble at home. And he was visibly struggling to keep going day to day. And one day, He was asked if he would come and and talk to the pastor, invited to come and talk and share his burden. And he said, well, I'd like to, I, I really would. The problem is if I did, I would get emotional and that just wouldn't do. How many people stay incomplete because they are scared to share their tears and honestly look? the trouble in our lives. Do you choose this path? Do you turn most invitations to share your struggles into a time to help someone else with theirs? In the television series Clarice, Clarice in the last episode sat with her therapist and when the therapist helped Clarice get to that most upsetting truth in her life. Clarice turned on her with anger. And using her abundant intelligence and insight, she began to attack the therapist with her words. And she wasn't wrong with her conclusions or with her descriptions. The actress who played the therapist twitches her muscles just enough to let you know that Clarice has hit the mark. But the therapist refuses to let Clarice change the subject. She volleys back and asks Clarice, why are you trying to make me not sign the paper that will allow you go to go back to work? She turns Clarice back to look back at herself, her own self, to look at her own pain, the very thing Clarice wants to avoid. But it was that very moment that leads to the breakthrough. And that feels so true and so honest and so real. That the thing that we least want to look at, when we're able to look at it, when we're able to feel it, that that can lead us to a breakthrough, to a freedom, to be free to be more with God, to be free to be alive once again. So consider, my dear church, that helping others can be a tool to avoid your own pain. And it can be a way to keep your heart hardened to the Spirit's work inside of you. And it can keep you from ever being complete, from ever breaking through the muck of your lives into the freedom that Jesus wants for you. If you're always helping and you're never receiving, if you're always on top and never in need, if you are doing these things, your heart becomes as hard as the heart of a rich man. And chances are you are sad. Because when your life is about helping others, but you're unwilling to receive help, You are like a pinball bouncing off the hard surface, one hard surface after another. Jimmy Mulatto, a consultant to nonprofit organizations, said, The single biggest issue in the nonprofit world is that you end up doing God's work in a way that destroys God's work in you. If you want to change lives, then you need to be willing to let God change your life.
church, we need to recognize in ourselves and, and, and bring out in ourselves what we seek for others, that, that softened heart that is able to receive the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not found in our doing one more good thing. It is instead given to us when we open up our hearts, our need, our longings, our hopes, our troubles to Jesus as if Jesus were standing right there in front of us. Catherine Marshall tells of another man named Sam. And Sam grew up in a seminary professor's house. And for him, faith was an intellectual exercise, and he hated all those evangelistic, emotional type of hymns. But one day, the helper came into Sam's life, and immediately, there was a change. Marshall writes, any time that Sam spoke of Jesus, we would see tears in his eyes. Suddenly, for the first time, Jesus was a person. Sam was not embarrassed or apologetic about the moisture behind his eyes or in his eyes. He knew something had changed. Something had changed him at the deep heart level. The hardness that was there before had been softened. He had been made responsive to the touch of God. For faith to be complete, it has to go beyond the head, beyond that which keeps you in control. It goes beyond that which you have and that which you can do for another. Spirit doesn't only lead you outward, it leads you inward. The helper helps you with your need. Look, God never tires of people who bring their complaints, their hearts, their longings to him. Look at David, who in Psalm 13 says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And so forth. But David directly addresses God. There's no question of his belief. God is there, and, God, and, and David is sharing with God his heart. In contrast is that picture of unfaithfulness, which is described by the Hebrew uh, preacher. When the preacher refers to the rebellion, he references Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7, where Israel is thirsty, and there's no water in sight. And so they ask, well, gosh, why are you bringing us out here to, to kill us with thirst? Is God with us or not? They are not asking the Lord. They are asking Moses. They do not want to talk to the Lord. They only want the Lord to serve them like a stewardess would serve us people on an airplane. Do you see the difference? A hardened heart turns us away from the living God. A hardened heart will not admit need. A hardened heart thinks it is free when it continues to long for Egypt. In contrast, a softened heart turns toward the living God, speaks to the living God. A softened heart admits need. A softened heart understands that it is free when it is able to give spirit permission to do its work inside of here. So I want to encourage each of you, as I encourage my own self, to practice softening your heart this week. Remember, faith is a practice. We never do the Christian faith perfectly. And just as we need to practice listening for when spirit leads us outward, we also need to practice opening our hearts so spirit can reach us inward. Now, tears are a good way to sense the spirit. I often would preach a sermon or wouldn't preach a sermon until I could feel the tears behind my eyes. If something is leading you to feel those tears, chances are spirit is speaking to you, trying to get you to recognize something inside of you that needs to be addressed, to bring it into the light so that you might start to heal. 
Don't be afraid of tears, use them. Be like Sam, realize that they're pointing you to the care and the love and the grace of Jesus. Secondly, try honestly sharing with someone what is going on inside of you. Set the parameters with the person. Let the other one know that you just need to share this day, that you need room to explore what the Spirit is trying to tell you, speak into you, do through you. Find someone, friends, that you can trust. Someone who will not turn the conversation to what is wrong with you or what you need to do to be fixed or to their own need. Find instead someone who will listen to the Spirit with you and who will quietly share only a few words that come from the Holy Spirit. And third, practice praying directly, emotionally, even emotionally to your God. Let it all out. Write the prayer or walk the prayer or speak the prayer or sing the prayer or scream the prayer. Pray believing with all your heart that God is in that room, that God cares about you and that God will hear and that God will answer you. Let it all out. And as you do these things, as you work on the inside, you will be able to be better used of God on the outside. See, I continue to teach the principle from my grandmother's hands that an unsettled soul unsettles others. And so we'll just turn that to the positive. A settled and healed soul can settle and heal others. So we who would bring peace to others and bring peace into the world, we need to practice softening our own hearts so we might settle, so we might heal, so we might become the helper that we would want to have speaking into our lives. So start in here. And there is no telling then where God will send you next. Amen.